Savior of praise. Exalt his name. Hallelujah in the house. Praise the name of the Lord. I have a topic today that I know many people have had a lot of questions about and are very interested in. So we will dive in, but I want to open up with a scripture. We will, we've already prayed in. We may pray a, a little bit more. And we are going to dive into what we have today. Today we're learning about the end times. Today we're learning about the signs of the times and particularly God's calendar. I want to deal with this. We're going to get, open up with one scripture and then you may be seated. Luke 21, verse 28. Luke chapter 21, verse 28. And it reads, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Father God, we give you glory and praise for being in this place. Thank you, God, for gracing us with your presence. Bless even my lips to speak only of you, that your anointing will flow through this place, that lives will change, that fire will be ignited, and that we will go forth with a holy boldness and celebration of what you have to come. In the name of Jesus, somebody say hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. There is a scripture, there is a scripture that I believe we need to learn a little bit more in the depths of what it means. We like this scripture so we can get in this a little bit, but y'all ever heard the scripture that says, if these people didn't praise me, the rocks would cry out. Luke chapter 19, verse 40. I want to break this thing down because there are hidden things in the Bible, and many of them weren't intended to be hidden. They may have been supposed to be hidden from the world, but not from us as the church. See, a lot of times we look at things like the end times, and we just pass over it. We say things like, well, the Lord said no man knows the day or the hour, so we don't know when it's going to come, so we're just going to sit and wait. Well, actually, God said in Thessalonians, he says that, yes, I'm coming as a thief in the night. However, he said, however, those of you who are the church, who are watching and praying, you sh I shall not come as a thief to you. However, you should be aware of my coming. The scripture, there's more to that scripture. And it says we should be prepared. Let me show you about this preparation quickly. There are Let's start with in David. In David's time, 1 Chronicles, I believe it's chapter 12, God began assembling David an army. He started sending people with him because he says, I have anointed you to be king. And as you take over this kingship, your territory, you're going to have to conquer. But when you conquered this, he then began to name the armies that he would send to David. And he would name mighty men. And notice that the mighty men that David, uh, God gave David were not people that came with military experience or anything special. They were normal. Matter of fact, they were worse than normal. The Bible says they were the worst of them. They were the ones that nobody wanted. But when they got the power of God in them, they became so mighty that they were doing great greater feats than what you saw with Samson. One man could go and kill a thousand because their power came on them. Yeah. But while God was assembling these armies, he then set a set of sons called the sons of Issachar. And the sons of Issachar, he said, these are they that will understand the signs and seasons. They'll know the times that you're in. Why, when God is assigning an army, does he assign people who simply know what time it is? Because how can you know where or how to conquer if you don't know who you're fighting? We are supposed to know where we are. Let me show you what happened when Israel did not know. This scripture about praising God is more than just a praise. It was actually a condemnation of the nation. 
chapter, Luke 19, verse 40, it says, and this is the time, let me tell you when this was. This was what we will be celebrating on tomorrow. This is why this is a timely message, because on tomorrow, we're entering what's called Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus rode into town on a donkey. It was the day that the people actually celebrated Jesus. Even though one week later, not even one week later, five days later, they were crucifying him. But on this day, they celebrated, they put down palm branches, they, and they sang Hosanna in the heights. Not realizing that David had written in the Psalms prophetically that that would be the song that would be sang to the Lamb of God. And they sang to Jesus out of their spirit, but five days later they would kill him. Now when this happened, this is what Jesus said when people were wondering what's going on here. Luke 19, 40, it says, And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. But then look what happens next, because it gets sad. He says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If they had known, even at least in this thy day, they said if they had known what this day was and this was their day, then they would have had peace. The things which belong unto their peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Then he tells them the terrible things that are going to happen to them because they didn't know what day it was. He says, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench around thee and compass thee around and keep thee on every side and they shall lay even thee to the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation see God gave many many signs to let them know that Jesus the Messiah was coming. But not only just prophetic signs in the seasons in the stars and different things, because those that he had plenty of spiritual signs, but you know, he even just for, for some of us that are spiritually a little bit slower, he gave them some math. There was a countdown. And you could tell that they didn't understand the countdown, because most of y'all looking at me like, I didn't know there was math. We didn't even know it was in the Bible. Well, God said, because they did not know the countdown, that's the reason that they would be destroyed. Israel, after this, 40 years later, would become destroyed and scattered across the entire world. They are the only country ever in history to be scattered across the world and then come back and form again as a nation. But at this time, they were scattered for 2,000 years, nearly 2,000 years. And he said it was because you did not know what this day was. Yeah. There were signs, there were seasons, there were things that I showed you, but if you didn't understand that, you could have at least counted. See, there's a chapter in the Bible in the book of Daniel, one of the most prophetic men to ever live. Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse 24 and going down through 27. We don't have to get too deep into it. I'm just going to give you the basics. Daniel is visited by an angel, and he is given what's called a 70-week prophecy. This week here is not a week of weeks the way we talk it. It's a week of years. What we call a decade, they follow in sevens. So instead of 10 years for a decade, they had a week of week of years. And he gave them 70 weeks of years until the end of the world. However, he said there will be 69 weeks and then a gap. Why is the gap? Because they wouldn't catch on when the 69 weeks was, so he would leave them and go to the Gentiles. And there would be a 2,000 year gap. We're in that gap now. Right. But he gave them a date. He said there will be 69 weeks from a particular decree that when I allow you, because you're already in captivity now for not paying attention to the seasons, and so when I take you out of captivity from the date that the king lets you free, Count 69 weeks of years. You don't have to do the math. I'll do it for you. That's 483 years. You want to break it down into days? That's 173,880 days. From the day 
that the king allows you to escape and then Jesus will come. There was math. 173,880 days they could have counted. And if you look even in our own regular history books, I'm not talking about the Bible, I'm talking about our history, we actually know what date that was. Nehemiah chapter 2, the cupbearer brings the cup to the king, and he says, look, I'm distressed because my people have not been set free to rebuild the walls of the city, and the king is moved in compassion and says, I will give you everything you need to go and do what the Lord has called you to do. That date was March 14, 445 B.C. If you count the math of 173,880 days, it brings you to Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus said, if the rocks, if these people didn't cry out, the rocks would have to, because this day was designated from the foundations of the world. But because they did not know the calendar, you will be scattered and lose your land for almost 2,000 years. It is important for us to understand the times of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That began what was called a set time and appointments that Jesus, God gave that proved that Jesus was Christ. In Leviticus 23, there's these things called Feast of Israel. I'm not here to preach about the Feast of Israel, but I'm going to just give you a highlight so you understand what it is. We hear things like feast, and we hear words like Israel, and both of those things sound like things that we don't have to deal with. It sounds like something that was under the law. However, if you look in Exodus, Passover started before the law ever began, so we cannot use that as an excuse. And neither, but also those words are probably misleading. If we understood the words, we would understand a little bit better. The word feast has nothing to do with the feast. It's just translated as feast because a lot of times on these appointments, they ate. <laughs> but it had nothing to do with the feast. The word is moed, and moed means appointment, literally appointment with God. The word moed is the same word that's used in the beginning of the Bible when God says, I gave you stars in the sky for signs and seasons. The word, the word season is also moed. It's the same word. They translated feast in one place and seasons in another. It's neither one of those things. It is divine appointments in which I have set for you to understand what the Messiah would do and when he would do it. God gave us a calendar. And it began on Palm Sunday. And he shows us in Leviticus 23 how that calendar works. This is how it works. He says you begin by selecting a perfect lamb on this particular day. You have to find one with no blemish. And on that day that you select the perfect lamb, you then wait five days later and you sacrifice that lamb. And when you sacrifice that lamb, I will forgive your sins for another year. Well, the perfect lamb God sent was Jesus, which is why he had to come into the town on that day, because he was the perfect lamb of God. It then goes on and says, wait five days, and then we begin what's called Passover. Passover was a time, we are in the Old Testament, when the death angel passed over. They put the blood of the lamb over their doorpost, and the death angel passed over Israel and only went and killed the Egyptians. The blood of Jesus is what's causing the death angel to pass over us, even right now. Because Jesus became that perfect lamb. But the thing is, Jesus also had to fulfill these feasts, these appointments. These were appointments. And as we study them, you'll find that Jesus fulfilled every appointment, not only on the day of the appointment, but, but literally on every hour. Every hour that God told them, this is what you're doing, Jesus would then go and perform that thing with his life at the same time. So Jesus was selected on Palm Sunday at the same time the people were selecting their lambs. 
Jesus was then crucified on Passover the same time that they would be celebrating Passover and killing their lambs. When Jesus hung on that cross, it was literally the exact hour that the high priest was slaying the lambs of the people. It was so specific that the people had to put the name of their family crest on their lamb so that as it was sacrificed, the name to go up into heavens. And God put his name, many of us didn't even realize, on Jesus. So if you look on many of the Catholic crosses, you'll see the word I-N-R-I written on, on there. That's Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Uh, Pilate wrote it on there, kind of mocking the, uh, the Hebrews. But if you actually look in, because it says he wrote it in not just Latin, but he also wrote it in Hebrew and in Greek. And what that translates to in Hebrew is Y-H-V-H, yud Hey vav Hey Jehovah. God literally put his name on his lamb the same way their name was on their lamb. That's why the, pre the, the, uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees got so angry and said, change the name. It says Jehovah. Jesus died uh -huh. on Passover day. The next feast starts the next day. It's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus was in the ground during this appointment because he represented a sinless life because he had no leaven in him. The Bible then says the way they had to celebrate the feast and the next feast, and they had been doing this for thousands of years at this point, is the day after Sabbath, that means Sunday, the first, next, the first Sunday after the feast, you then begin your next appointment. It's called the appointment of first fruits. And the way you celebrate that is you take the first fruits of your harvest and you sacrifice it to God. You cannot touch of the first fruit. You cannot bother the first fruit. These are for God. When Joshua and the people conquered the very first place they came to in the promised land, God said, don't touch anything in this land. Sacrifice it all. This is all for me. After you take this one place, after Jericho comes down, then you can take everything from every other land. But in this one, which is my first, I have chosen my own first fruit. There's a Rahab, a prostitute named Rahab. That's my first that I'm going to start, and she will be the great-grandmother of Jesus. And so on first fruits was the Sunday after Passover. Well, what happened on Sunday after Passover? Jesus rose from the dead on the appointment that God gave them thousands of years earlier. That's the reason when he rose from the dead, he said, don't touch me because I have not yet gone to the Father and he's first. That's why after he ascended, then he came back down and said, touch my hands, touch my side, but you can't touch me first because I had to celebrate the feast, the appointment of first fruits. In the Old Testament, when they were celebrating these appointments, God then told them after first fruits count 50 days. And once you get to the 50th day, you take two Piece of, piece of wheat and you wave them above your head to celebrate what I call Shabbat in the Old Testament, the Feast of Weeks. Well, what happened 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead? There was what we call Pentecost. 50, where the Holy Spirit came down onto the earth and the two wheat that they had to, re to represent represented the church. One for the Jews, but one for what they were ready for. The Gentiles are going to get the Spirit of God. And it happened not only on the day, but on the very hour that they were celebrating. These were appointments that God gave in advance. Those four appointments represent what Jesus did in his first coming. There is then a gap. And then we have three more feasts left. Those feasts represent what Jesus will do on his next coming. Don't you think we should be aware of the power?
Let me tell you something, and you're going to like this. The next feast that comes up happens to be what we call the Feast of Trumpets. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The next appointment on the list is we are caught up at the sound of the trumpet to be with him. things like, well, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. Let's deal with that. Let's, let's, let's deal with that. The feast, all each one of these feasts, the way that you find what time it is, is you look at the stars and you understand based on where the moon is when the feast begins. Or where the sun is where the feast begins. But there was one feast that was obscure. There was one feast that they had difficulty with. And it was the Feast of Trumpets. Why? Because it was the only one that began on what's called a new moon. And a new moon can happen any time over a 48-hour period. It's not on a particular day, but they can narrow it down to within two days. They just do not know which of those two days the first silver sliver of that moon would appear. But when they sat there and they continued watching, looking up at night, waiting, because they understood at least the time period in which it would come, then when they saw it, they began blowing the trumpets. And when they get to the last trump, the long one, everybody celebrated because that began the Feast of Trumpets. And because they did not know when the feast would actually occur, it was referred to as the feast that no man knows the day or the hour. When Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour, he was being both literal but also telling you, but I'm telling you when the appointment is. And when it starts getting close, all I need you to do is look up because your redemption draws nigh. We're supposed to understand the times and the seasons so we can look up in time. chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. These are the signs, the, the things that we've heard about so that we have understanding. Let's break this down quickly. Starting in verse 6, it says, And when ye hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. First of all, I need you to understand, a lot of times we're scared of these things when we talk about revelation and all this stuff. If you, you not notice the theme here, for those of us who are watching and waiting constantly, Jesus says, this should excite you, don't be afraid. Yeah. When this stuff gets bad, gets excited. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say, oh Lord, hunker down, it's about to get bad. He said, look up! And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. See, we're going to get in this scripture, it's going to go on, and it's going to say that this is the beginning of sorrows in verse 8. Well, the word sorrows here is a word that we do not use in modern English, but in the olden day, that was a word that meant birth pains. God is calling this being birthed out. And you understand based on birth 
campaigns, you can start to track when things are going to happen. We have a pretty much calendar uh, from the moment of conception. We can get kind of close to when the baby will be birthed. And God compared this in time to that time period saying, if you can at least just pay attention to the Bible as much as you pay attention to a pregnancy, you'll get an understanding of basically when I'll come. And so he said, this is the beginning of the birth pains. But then he says, when you hear the wars and the rumors of war, the time is not yet. In other words, those aren't the birth pains. Those are the Braxton Hicks. It still means you're pregnant. There's still something coming, but that's not the end. You're still supposed to pay attention, but that's not the sign. That just lets you know you're in the end times, but you're not at the end of the end. You're pregnant, but you're not about to get birth. They're false signs. This is good. Nation shall rise against nation, in verse 7. Kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now he's getting a little bit more into the sorrows, the birth pain. The next verse he says, this is the beginning of sorrows. So what does that mean? What does it say? It says famine. Oh, that's what we're going through right now here in America. It has begun. Pestilences, COVID-19. Earthquakes in Turkey. In diverse places. But if you compare it to a pregnancy, you understand what Jesus is saying. These are signs of contraction. However, the baby cannot come off of one contraction. The baby doesn't come off of two contractions. But when the contractions start coming back to back to back to back to back to back to back, to back to back. You look up and there's a famine. And the same day you hear an earthquake. And the same day a war done started. And the same day another COVID-19 broke out. And when the headlines start saying all the same things, you're supposed to look up to your redemption. Verse 9, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. For many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I need you to understand that this is what we are moving into now. When they start getting offended at your ministry, when they start telling you, rather than adjusting to what the word says, they tell you, you have to adjust the word to my lifestyle. And if you don't adjust your word to my lifestyle, I am now offended and I hate you.